Alright, so today we are going to be talking about Markov Chain Monte Carlo and the Metropolis algorithm. So Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC as it's commonly referred to, is definitely one of the most powerful tools in modern statistics. And the Metropolis algorithm is the archetypal example. In fact, the Metropolis algorithm was named one of the top 10 most important algorithms of the 20th century by the journal Computing in Science and Engineering. Alright, so Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC, comes from this family of techniques known as uh, Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, so these can trace their origin back to the 1940s, 1950s, with a group of physicists working at Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico. And so one of these guys, Denis Ulam, was recovering from surgery, and while doing this, he was just killing some time, playing solitaire, and he started thinking to himself, you know, I wonder what the chances are of actually being able to win any given game of solitaire. Because any of you who have played solitaire before know uh, that just sometimes you deal out the cards and it's just not a winnable configuration of cards. So he was sitting there trying to figure this out, just straight combinatorically, and it pretty quickly became obvious that this, just figuring this out analytically, is not feasible. I mean, if you think about the number of configurations a 52-card deck of cards can take, that is 52 factorial, which, if you do out, is on the order of 10 to the 67. That's the same order of magnitude as what scientists have estimated the number of atoms in the Milky Way to be. And so, just computing this out, especially at this day and age when computers were just starting to be built, was just not going to happen. So he got this idea that, why don't I just deal out a bunch of games and just record the results and use that data to give myself a picture of what the probability distribution here looks like. So when he goes back to Los Alamos Labs, he's talking to all his co-workers, he's talking to Von Neumann, Fermi, Metropolis, a lot of the guys, same guys who worked on the Manhattan Project actually, and they all quickly begin to see that this, this concept right here of using a discrete statistical sample of some given system is an excellent way to actually approximate the probability distribution of it, or really any given feature of it. And so uh, Monte Carlo simulation was born. Um, and the name actually comes from not one of the scientists, but a casino in Las Vegas. And you can kind of understand why they named it after casino. You know, this whole idea of chance and probability, rolling the dice, you might say, to find some sample from a system. And it also might have had something to do with the fact that Ulam's father lost a pretty significant amount of money in this casino. And here is some artist's interpretation of what Ulam might have looked like back in the 1940s, flipping his coin and leaning on his giant pair of dice. Alright, so let's say we've got a probability distribution, uh, possibly in a very high dimension, or it's really complicated, and we want to sample from it or find the expected value of it, and doing so by traditional means just doesn't make sense. So we can do this using Markov Chain Monte Carlo. The basic idea is that we perform a random walk through the distribution, favoring values with higher probabilities. So what I mean by this is that once we have a starting point, we can randomly pick a point nearby and then evaluate that point's probability. And if that point's probability is higher than the point we started on, we move there and accept that point. Otherwise, uh, we have I've predefined some function which gives us a probability that we will accept that point even though it's at a lower probability, but if, then if we don't accept it, we just stay where we are and try again. And so the really amazing thing about this is that if we iterate through this scheme enough, we will actually visit every single point in the probability distribution proportional to how probable that point is. 
So here, let's do a really simple example of MCMC. And right now, we are going to do this, just the simplest one we can think of, and that would be a Gaussian centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. So obviously, in real life, you would not need to use MCMC for this. It's very simple and well understood what this probability distribution function looks like and how to sample from it. So here's just a plot of your general Gaussian. And then we perform, I ran some code to perform MCMC on this. And here's the histogram of the, all the points I sampled from it after 250,000 iterations, which, you know, isn't really all that much. And we can see this very well shows the shape of the normal, and it gives us um, our expected value right at zero. Well, actually, it looks like it might be to the little left of zero, but I expect that's just some artifact of the binning I did here. So now I am going to give you a once-in-a-lifetime experience to actually peer behind the curtain and see what that code was doing in the previous slide. So you start right here. This is our starting guess. Let's say I had no idea what a Gaussian looked like, and I was thinking, you know, maximum likelihood is probably going to be around 0.5. So I start here, and then we start iterating through this algorithm. And so we take an x-guess. We move down here. It's less likely now, but apparently it passed the acceptance test, and we moved there. Oh, but now this time we jump up here, and it's like, oh, this point is much more probable. We'll hang out here, and as you can see, we slowly just trace a path through this distribution function. You know, we start getting down low over here, but really we like to hang out near the top here. And that's where most of our points are going to be. But the important thing is that, yeah, we do actually explore these lower probability areas. But in the end, most of our points are going to be clustered near the top. Let's move on to a more realistic example of MCMC. And that is going to be the one from the famous paper, Equation of State Calculations by Fast Computing Machines which was done by Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, Teller, and Teller in 1953. And this is really the paper that started it all. This was the origin of MCMC and the Metropolis algorithm. And here's Metropolis right here. This is actually a picture from his ID badge when he was working at Los Alamos. And so the goal of this paper was to calculate the properties of a system comprised of interacting mo molecules using Monte Carlo methodologies. All right, so and here's what the algorithm looks like. So we've got this system of all these molecules together, and we will move one of them slightly. And then we will calculate the change in energy of the system, delta E. And this is based on the Boltzmann equations, which can actually tell us the energy of a given system determined by the temperature and just the distance between the molecules. So this is the potential energy. Um, and then if the energy is less than the previous state, so that means if the energy drops when we move this one molecule, we accept the change. Otherwise, we accept the change with a probability of E to the delta E, where delta E is the change in energy, over KT, where K is the Boltzmann constant and temp T is the temperature of the system. So that allows us to actually so, uh, sometimes move two configurations of molecules, which actually increase the energy of the system slightly and are less probable. And so what this does is it lets us explore all of the accessible states of the system at a given temperature and gives us a snapshot of what really the most likely ones are. So here's what this would look like. So let's say we've got this two-dimensional box and there is a bunch of molecules in it. So we start out with this one right here and we'll put a box around it right here. This isn't actually a physical box, this just this tells us the range in which we are going to allow this molecule to move. So we are going to randomly move it somewhere in this box, let's say right up here. And then once we do that, we are going to calculate the change in energy of the entire system. And so let's say we've calculated the change in energy, and by moving this molecule here, the energy of the system has actually dropped. So therefore, due to the laws of entropy, uh, this system likes this configuration a little bit more. So we'll accept that and let this molecule stay here. 
And then we will move on to another molecule. And again, put this box around it, letting us know just the where we're going to let it move. And let's say, oh, we move this one just a little bit down here. And let's say, oh, this time, you know, this actually increases the energy of the system a little bit. So we're not just going to reject it straight out white. We will give it some probability of moving there. So that means um, we'll give it a probability of e to the delta e over kt, like we said on the previous slide. And then we'll just choose some random number between 0 and 1 drawn from a uniform distribution. And if that number is less than that number of e to the negative delta e over kt, we'll accept this change. So let's say we did that, and oh, no, it, it didn't pass. So then we move it back to where it was and move on to the next molecule and do the same thing again the next molecule and do this for all of them and then just repeat and go through this many 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 times and then at the end we have this nice wonderful data set of all the configurations this has taken and we know that it's more likely to take configurations where the energy has dropped and therefore it's a much more natural configuration and so really by doing this we can understand for a given temperature what the possible configurations of these molecules will look like. And this was done using some of the first computers developed at Los Alamos. And this was actually done on a computer named ENIAC. And each iteration, meaning like each time we move one of these molecules in this box and compute its change in energy, that took about three minutes. So this overall experiment the paper was published on took days to run. Of course today with our technology, Doing this would take a fraction of a second, so you can really see why, with the advent of computers, this became such an important method. I've explained to you now what Monte Carlo is all about, but what about these Markov chains, you might be wondering? Because after all, we are talking about Markov chain Monte Carlo. So a Markov chain is any sequence of numbers or events which follows this graphical model. And what this graphical model is telling you is that each event in this sequence is only dependent on the event that occurred directly before it. And so we can write that out as like the probability of x5 given x4, x3, x2, and x1 is simply the probability of x5 given x4. So each event is only determined probabilistically by the event that happened before it. All right, so here is a discrete example of a Markov chain. And so we can describe a Markov chain using like a transition graph or this transition matrix. These both describe the same system. So we have these three things right here. We've got x1, x2, and x3. And so what these arrows mean are, so let's say we're at x1. And then we've got this one arrow right here with a one in that. So what this tells us is that we're, if we're at x1, there is a probability of 1 that we will move to x2. And then from x2, there is a probability of 0.1 that we will just stay at x2, and a probability of 0.9 that they will, we will then move to x3. And then x3, there's a probability of 0.4 that will move to x2, and a probability of 0.6 that will move to x1. So given any initial starting point, you will move through the system, move over here and back to x2, and then say at x2, and back to x3, to x1, to x2. And so over time, you'll just explore this system. And then we can also describe this as this transition matrix. So what this matrix is saying is that Tij is the probability of moving from xi to xj. So like T11 is the probability of moving to X1 from X1, and that's obviously zero. And then also moving from X1 to X3 is zero, but then you've got this probability of one of moving to X2. And then from X2, like you've got this probability of 0.1 of just staying at X2, and this probability of 0.9 of moving to X3. So let's actually kind of explore this system. So let's take this starting point, x0, which uh, tells us it's there's a 0.5 probability of being at x1, a 0.2 probability of being at x2, and a 0.3 probability of being at x3. 
So then to move to the next system, what we do is just, um, so x1 is equal to x0 times t. So that's just, we multiply from the right this vector x by our transition matrix t. And so what that tells us is then the next step, uh, there's a probability of 0.2 will be at x1, a probability of 0.6 will be at x2, and a probability of 0.2 will be at x3, given this state before it. And then we can keep doing this in every iteration. These numbers will evolve. And eventually, we are going to converge to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. In fact, no matter what we choose as a starting point, we can choose any x0 right here, we will converge to this. And so really, when we're performing MCMC, what we're doing is actually uh, creating a Markov chain. Our sequence of events is a Markov chain, but obviously it's not just a simple discrete Markov chain like this, but one of infinite dimension if we are in some continuous space, like the examples we've seen before. And so the chain we've been looking at right here uh, has some really important properties as far as MCMC is concerned that actually for um, MCMC to work we need it to have these properties and the two properties are that it's irreducible and that it's aperiodic. What irreducible means is that for every state there is a positive probability of moving to any other state and that means for example in this system that if we're at x2 there is a positive probability that through some sequence of events we can reach x3 and we can reach x1. And that's very obvious because from x2 we can get to x3 and from x3 we can get to x1. So from x2 there is a positive probability that you can move to any other state. And the same goes for x3 and for x1. Then the other important property is that it is aperiodic. And so what that means is you're not going to get trapped in cycles. So let's say that this branch right here, this probability of moving to x1 from x3 is gone. And also let's, uh, let's take out this 0.1 right here. So pretty much we are going to get trapped in this cycle between x2 and x3 for you to cycle between from x2 we move to x3 and then from x3 we move back to x2. And just this continues, and we'll never reach x1 again. So given these two properties, we can say that the chain is ergodic. And what that means is that it will and can explore every state in the system that is possible. And that's really important for MCMC. So what we've talked about is this method does explore the entire state space and does so that proportional to the probability of each area. So that is a brief primer on Markov chains. So here it is, what we've all been waiting for, the general form of the Metropolis algorithm. Actually, what we're looking at here is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm because of this term right here, but I'll get to that in a second. So what we do is we start out with some initial guess, and then we iterate over this scheme. And so every iteration is taking one step in our domain. So the first thing we want to do is sample from what's called the proposal distribution, this function q. And what that is is a way to, starting with whatever point we're at, generate some new random point somewhere kind of near that. That's our random walk. So for example, when we were talking about the molecules in a box, that box we drew around each molecule and then moved it inside that, that is our q right here. So the proposal distribution uh, generates a proposal point, x star, where it's just dependent on where we've been, this xi, whatever, whatever the previous iteration was on. So, um, so that, you can see why this is a Markov chain then, because every new point we choose is solely dependent on where we were beforehand. So we have that, and then we take it into this right here. So what we're doing here is comparing the probability of our proposal point to the point we were already at. Then this term over here is the proposal function uh, based on, so here it's the probability of the point we were at given our proposal point, and then that's over the probability of moving to the proposal point given that we were at our previous point. 
And so this is the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, but in the Metropolis algorithm, this term right here disappears. And that's because in the Metropolis algorithm, we choose Q such that it creates a symmetric random walk. And what we mean by symmetric random walk means that a Q of X star given X i is the exact same thing as Q of X i given X star. So moving between two points, uh, the probability of movement depends only on distance. So that means these two points drop out here, and we're only looking at the ratio of the probability between our proposal point and our starting point that we're at. So what this is saying is we have uh, this value u, which we sampled from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, and we're seeing if it's less than this right here. And so this right here, let's say we move to our proposal point x star is more probable than where we're at. That means this right here is greater than 1, so we take this min, so we just choose 1, and that means u is always going to be less than this 1, so we accept it and move to that point. But let's say this is less than 1, so let's say the probability of the point we're starting at is more than the probability of our proposal point. So that means this is less than 1, and there is some probability that our value u is going to be still less than this. And then in that case, we accept this as well. So that means no matter what, there is some chance that we will move to our proposal point. But let's say we fail this test, then we just stay where we're at and continue with the iterations. And also notice uh, that this p doesn't actually have to be the full probability distribution function. Because if there's some kind of Bayes denominator, they're obviously just going to cancel out. So as long as you have some function here, which is proportional to the full PDF, we are good to go. We're going to see in some later examples that that is actually really useful. Okay, so let's return back to that example we did way back at the beginning, the really trivial one with a Gaussian centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. Here, for the proposal function q, we're just going to choose a Gaussian centered at xi with a standard deviation of 0.05. So that just means Every time, let's say we're starting right here, um, imagine there's the curve right here, we're going to take some normal distribution around it, the standard deviation of 0.05, and step somewhere in that. And that's this right here in the code. So that's our Q. So here, let's walk through this code right here. We have 250,000, and that's going to be the number of iterations we're going to take. And I'm just initializing our output right here. Uh, just, you know, good coding practice and our initial guess. So we're going to say our initial guess is 0.5. And you know, actually, in truth, that's not the worst initial guess. Obviously, since we have better knowledge of what the PDF we're simulating looks like, we could do a better guess than that. But that is within one standard deviation, so it's not bad, and we can expect it to converge pretty quickly. All right, so here's the loop with the real Metropolis algorithm built in. So here's our Q, our proposal distribution. So we choose from a normal distribution with standard deviation of 0.05, and it's centered at xi, so that's our previous point. So here is our proposal x. And then if some random number drawn between 0 and 1 uniformly is less than the minimum of 1 and the PDF of a normal function centered at 0 with standard deviation 1, so that's the PDF we're trying to simulate, we take that probability of the proposal point over the uh, probability of the previous point. And so if that passes, so that means that if this value right here, the probability of our candidate point, our proposal point, is greater than the probability of the point we're starting at, then we just accept it and we set the next point in our chain to that proposal point. Also, if that's not the case, and maybe it's a little bit less probable, this random, this random number can still be less than this ratio, and we can accept it. But then, let's say that number is greater than this ratio, then we're just going to stay at the point we're at and just continue on. And this runs through 250,000 times, and here's that output again. So this is the histogram of all the points in this vector x that we get from running mc mc. We are going to move on to a much more practical, real-life example. So this is going to be one from climatology and atmospheric science. So right here is a diagram of what's known as the energy balance model. And so what this is talking about 
is it's the balance of radiation coming in from the sun and then going out back into space, and then combined with this greenhouse effect here of radiation coming from the Earth's surface just being trapped here. So I'll walk you through this real quick. So we got radiation coming in from the sun, and some of that is going to be reflected by clouds and aerosols, things like that, back into space. So this never reaches the actual Earth. And then some of it's actually absorbed by the atmosphere. So it's not being reflected into space, and it's not being absorbed by the surface, but it's warming the atmosphere. And then there is some fraction of it, an actual pretty large fraction if you see, that is absorbed by the surface. But then also some of it is reflected off the surface, and that's what's known as albedo, the fraction of the total energy which hits the surface, which just bounces off and goes back into space. But then of the energy that's absorbed by the Earth, it can be it can leave in a few different ways. Um, it can be radiated back out, or it can be turned into just sensible heat, some like heating the atmosphere and rising up, or this evapotranspiration, this latent heat. It can be used to actually evaporate water and put it into the atmosphere. And then you've got your greenhouse effect right here, where some gases in the atmosphere will absorb this radiation, this long wave radiation being emitted by the Earth warming the atmosphere, and then it'll actually shoot some of that right back down to the Earth, and you get this cycle right here. So that's really important for actually keeping energy in this system and keeping some temp warm, nice, livable temperature at the Earth's surface. And then also, since the atmosphere is warm, it is emitting some radiation back out into space. So this whole model right here is actually really useful for studying the climate of the Earth. Um, but this is a huge simplification of a really complicated system. There are some major parameterizations in it and some uncertain parameters. And so one way to figure out some good choices for these parameters would be MCMC. So now we're going to use the Metropolis algorithm to fit uncertain parameters in the energy balance model. So using this model, we are going to calculate the average surface air temperature of the Earth under various parameter configurations. And then we're going to compare that to actual observed data and see how good a fit those parameters are to approximating the real world. And the parameters we're going to be looking at are planetary albedo, sulfate aerosol forcing, the strength of water vapor feedback, and the depth of the ocean affected by atmospheric warming. So what these things are, planetary albedo, is just the amount of radiation coming in from the sun gets reflected back into space by the surface of the Earth. And then sulfate aerosol forcing is the amount of solar radiation scattered by sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere. So that's solar radiation coming to the atmosphere and it's just scattered off so this no longer reaches the surface of the Earth. And then the strength of water vapor feedback. This is actually something that's really important to the Earth's climate because water vapor is a really strong greenhouse gas. But then as you heat the Earth's surface, uh, more water is going to be evaporated and put into the atmosphere. But then since water is a really strong greenhouse gas, that's going to heat up the Earth's surface, which in turn is going to evaporate more water. And so you can see you get this positive feedback loop, which just keeps warming the Earth. So the strength of this feedback is something that we're going to toggle as well. And then the depth of the ocean affected by atmospheric warming. Because the ocean acts as a really great place to store heat. So as this heat comes into the system of the Earth, a lot of it can just be absorbed by the ocean. And in the ocean, it, it varies a lot less in temperature than the land. So it's a huge regulating force in the Earth's climate. But only a certain fraction of it is actually affected by the, the air temperature of the Earth. Once you get down to a certain point, it's just cold water. It does not care what's going on in the atmosphere. All right, so what do we need to implement the Metropolis algorithm here? We need an initial guess for the parameters, a choice for PX, and a choice for our proposal distribution Q. The initial guess can really be anything in the domain, but we're better off having a good starting guess, something that's close to what we think the maximum likelihood would be. And in something like this, where likely science has been done on it before, we can find something in literature which will tell us where we should start this so it'll converge much faster. So in our previous example where we were talking about the Gaussian distribution we were trying to estimate, P of X was really clear. That was obviously just the Gaussian. 
This time, though, our model just outputs a value, the surface air temperature, and not necessarily some probability. But then, using observed data, we can construct a likelihood function, which is maximized by the model output and how it fits observational data. And a really easy choice for this is just an exponential function, uh, e to the negative cost, where cost is the square distance between the model output and observed data. And then for q of x, we'll simply choose a random step chosen uniformly from just a range of values around whatever point we're moving from. So this is going to be very similar to the box around the molecule we used for the state space example. All right, so now here is the code we would use. I've got two functions defined in here, step param and EBM model. So step param is a function that we give it where the parameters were at, and then it randomly moves those parameters around, set to the constraints we put in place, and gives us some candidate parameters, some proposal parameters. So this is Q right here. And then EBM model is our energy balance model. So we give it a set of parameters, and it outputs the cost of it, so how close that is to actual observed data. And then here is our test. So we take some random number from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1 and see if it's less than e to the difference in cost. How much does the cost change, the difference from observed temperatures, when we moved to this new Canada configuration? And you can see this is actually the cost function, that e to the negative cost of our candidate divided by e to the negative cost of where we were before. If this test passes, we accept the parameter, and then also we're just recording the cost for the, the next iteration to compare this right here. But then if this fails, if this random number is greater than this, then we just stay where we're at. And then we iteratively run over this. So we randomly step our parameters, we step the model, we check to see whether or not we want to move to this new point. And as always, even if this new point is, these new configuration parameters is worse than where we're at, there is some chance we will accept it. And before we put um, a min here of 1 or this, but I chose to leave this out because well, if this is greater than 1, then we'd just be choosing this min of 1, but no matter what, this random number from 0 and 1 will be less than that. And then so if we accept it, we record the stuff. If not, we stay where we are. So here is the output actually from running this. And so we can see that for the albedo, that one parameter, the amount of solar radiation reflected off the Earth's surface, we get a really good idea here of where that value should be, like right here. And then sulfate amplitude, same thing. It's not quite as steep a curve, but we get a good idea of what value we should use for this model to fit observed data. Then the water vapor feedback and the ocean depth, um, it's not quite as clear. Uh, so like, it looks like there might be some MLE, some really likely value of it over here and maybe over here, but it's kind of hard to tell. So this would mean that maybe we want to run some more iterations of the algorithm. And also just since we don't see a clear peak here, that means this parameter is slightly less interesting. Moving it around doesn't do quite as much um, to like alter the output of the function. Uh, same thing with ocean depth, kind of. We do see probably around here there's some maximum, and you wouldn't want to choose some parameter over here. But through MCMC, we have been able to sample this parameter space and find the parameters which give us the best results to get this energy balance model to fit real-world observations. So today we learned about Markov Chain Monte Carlo and the Metropolis algorithm. So this is a way to sample from a probability distribution and even calculate some expected values of it. And, you know, this is really useful for when you have some complicated function in higher dimensions. Because if you've got some simple function, you can get the same results using, like, a proposal distribution or a transition function. But those require that 
you have some idea of how to approximate the function using a simpler function or that you can actually compute the CDF of it. And that's not always possible if you've got a really complicated function or if it's in really high dimensions. MCMC is super useful for doing this. And I hope after today you've gotten a good intuitive idea of how this algorithm works and how to actually apply it to real world problems. And we only talked about the Metropolis algorithm, which is by far the simplest MCMC method. But now you should have a base to go off and learn about more complicated, much more powerful and efficient Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. All right, I hope you've enjoyed.